Good afternoon, sir. Can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Tapford. Can we um, pick up where we left off in the late afternoon of the 5th of February 2010 uh, by looking at FUJ 0012 2735? And if we scroll um, to the bottom half of the page, we'll see that on the 5th of February 2010 at 4.47, uh, Mr. Jenkins emailed um, David Jones, remember, uh, lawyer in Fujitsu, and Penny Thomas, um, also of <coughs> Fujitsu, uh, saying, David, I've provided in-line comments um, to the document as revisions. This was the third supplemental report of Professor Mo Glatton, and I don't want to turn the document up at the moment, but essentially he had gone through uh, Professor McGlatton's um, report and had um, added his comments to it. Um, I'm happy for this to be passed to the post office if you feel it is appropriate. Um, and then uh, Mr. Jenkins said the simple answer is that without retrieving the logs, everybody is speculating and as discussed this morning, nobody has bothered to ask us for any logs. At this stage, it is not at all clear what transactions are thought to be missing at what time or even in what time period. Analyzing logs over a long period, and I think this is over two or three months, is very, very time consuming. This is not gonna happen by Monday. Does anyone have a copy of Andy's um, uh, witness statement? And then if we scroll up, please. Uh, we can see that Mr. Jones forwards that to um, John L. Singh, um, copying in um, Gareth Thomas and, uh, sorry, Gareth Jenkins and Penny Thomas. And so this is Mr. Jenkins saying, is this right? Um, that in order to respond to Professor McGlatton's um, report, the post office needed to un uh, obtain um, underlying data, the transaction data. Yes, sorry, yes. By this time, um, that's February 2010, uh, had you been aware for a very considerable time that the defence wanted exactly the same data, the transaction uh, logs, as they're called, and that such logs had not been obtained? Yes, well, there was, a, there was a dis ongoing dispute about what period of logs was necessary. I appreciate with hindsight the post office was in the wrong, uh, but that was a number of many disclosure requests, and I, I do think that the full context needs to be looked at. Uh, if anybody thinks this was easy to deal with, they are deluding themselves. This was very difficult, and I was, we were all trying our best, I thought. Obviously, it didn't work, but we were trying our best. Uh, let's just look at the um, defence requests for exactly the same things as... Um, Gareth Jenkins was saying um, uh, are important and that without retrieving the logs, everyone's speculating. Um, can we look, please, at poll 305 2202? Uh, can we look at page three, please? And scroll down. Um, starting with an email um, the year before, 14th of July 2009, between John Longman and the fraud team, can you please assist with the following three points? Um, point two, the defence will be calling their own expert to analyse the horizon data, as the defendant is now claiming that some of the loss in the case is caused by errors within Horizon. Therefore, I will need transaction log data covering the period 30th of June 2005 to the 14th of January 2008, together with a covering witness statement. Um, and then page two, please. Scroll down. A reply from Mr. <coughs> Posnett. Um, due to the size of the AR re re ARQ request, I cannot authorise Fujitsu to proceed at this stage. We have an annual allowance of 670 ARQs. 
we can only request 60 ARQs per month. This defence request could be detrimental to other prosecution requests. We've got a contract uh, with Fujitsu to require ARQs for our prosecution cases. We pay for these. For lumpy defence requests, we can obtain a quote from Fujitsu. Aside from the costs and our quota, another reason for this approach is because many cases plead guilty at the 11th hour and or nothing is found by the experts in inverted commas to challenge the Fujitsu data, the usual attempt at muddying uh, the waters. Can you uh, consider and seek views or input from our criminal lawyer in the case? Happy to discuss. Then page one, please. Um, emailed Mr. Longman to uh, John L. Singh. At the hearing, the defense indicated they would be seeking services of a forensic accountant to analyze the horizon data. I've tried to order the data for the time Ms. Misra was sub postmaster three years, but as you can see, there are a number of issues. Could uh, you advise counsel of these issues and inform me as to what action to take? Uh, do you recall being involved in this? Yes, I do, um, but I don't think via email, but obviously I was speaking with Janel Singh on the phone, so I may have been speaking on the phone around this time. I, I don't have a specific recollection, but I was aware of the ongoing issue and I was trying to see uh, if um, it might be possible to have a, have a, a, a less wide span. I appreciate now that's obviously wrong, but that's what we're trying to do, the way of dealing with the competing demands that are obvious in these emails. Can you, um, do you now have a rec recollection of being asked to advise on this issue? I, 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 I don't think, I, I can't remember a specific request. There was an ongoing conversation um, and in my, in my earlier advice, I tried to set, um, oh, forgive me, I'm getting the time period wrong now. So they, we've gone back to We've gone right backwards. Well, oh, well, that, sorry, well, then it's, uh, I think it was an ongoing discussion, but we've gone backwards. So, um, uh, this, well, this will lead up eventually to, to what we come up with or what the, the post office decided to produce. So what I'm looking at is Mr Jenkins in February 2010 saying, I can't assist you unless you get the underlying data. And I'm yes. going back to the summer before saying the defence are asking for the underlying data and um, trying to work out what happened with that request. And at the moment, the investigator, Mr Longman, has asked Mr um, Posnett. Mr Posnett said, um, we've got a contract. It would exceed our requirements, essentially. Under the, uh, the contract, it would be expensive. That's forwarded to John L. Singh by Mr Longman. And he says, could you advise counsel of these issues and inform me as to what action to take? And I'm asking, at this time, in uh, summer 2009, were you, um, did you provide advice on the approach to take to disclosure of the underlying data? I, I don't know. I may have said, so. I may have provided advice over the phone, but I, I simply can't remember. It is quite a long time ago. Yes. Obviously didn't provide anything in writing, so there may be nothing. I don't know. Can we look, please, at um, FUJ 0015 uh, 4851? And look at page four, please. <clears throat> um, this is a letter dated the 14th of August, <coughs> um, 2009. <clears throat> and if we scroll down to the um, next page, we can see who wrote it. Keep going. Phil Taylor. Um, back up, please. And we can see it's to the, the then defence solicitors. If we scroll up a little bit. Thank you, the Castle Partnership. Um, I understand from prosecuting counsel that on the last occasion, defence counsel asked for horizon data for the period during which your client was sub postmistress at West Blyfeet, West Blyfeet sub post office. Is that right that defence counsel asked you um, for disclosure of horizon data for the entire period when Mrs. Misra was sub postmistress. Well, 
Well, that was certainly an ongoing request. I can't remember when it, a request at court. I'm not going to remember at this time unless there's no. an email. Understood. As you may be aware, the Horizon system is a product of Fujitsu Limited, and the post office has purchased this system from Fujitsu in the same way that any other company would purchase goods or services for its business. Other than that, Fujitsu is not in any way an associated company of the post office. The request has been put to Fujitsu and a reply has been received by the person who liaises with this company. The data will take six to eight weeks to produce. Our client uh, made 107 calls to the Horizon help desk. <coughs> Sorry, your client made 107 <coughs> calls to the Horizon help desk during her period of tenure, which equates to roughly two to three calls per month. In order to provide the data, Fujitsu will wish to know exactly what is required and for exactly what period. Please could you also advise as to why you consider the data relevant? Uh, you already know from the NAE from Andrew Dunks, um, uh, dealing with the calls to the help desk, um, the retrieval of data by Fujitsu is not a free service, it's very expensive and depends upon the amount of data which has to be retrieved, which is why you're requested to be very precise. At that stage, a firm quotation can be obtained and council will be asked to give further advice as to disclosure and payment for this service. The post, service will, the post office will not underwrite the cost if council considers the data irrelevant. You will of course be aware that the same system operates throughout the country and was not particular to your client's sub-post office. I've set, the matter, um, uh, set out the matter above quite clearly because in the past many thousands of pounds have been spent on obtaining this type of uh, data subsequent to which a late plea of guilty is tendered, which means that the exercise has been a complete waste of time and money. And so that essentially reflects the positive answer, doesn't it? Yes, no, it does. Um, if we go to page three... Um, we can see that Mr. Taylor, on the same day, 14th of August, sends a copy of the letter to Post Office Security, um, CC John Longman, and it says, here's a letter which I've written to the defence and copied to counsel for your information. Um, I, I can't see any evidence on the face of it that it was copied um, to you. Um, but can we deal with it this way? Oh, certainly. If I see the letter, I'm happy to deal with it. But I, 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 I didn't, it may well have been sent to me. If it, that, there's no reason for saying a copy to counsel unless, unless it's been done. Did um, what is set out in the letter reflect any advice that you had given to the post office as to the correct approach to obtaining what we now know to be ARQ data? I, I can't remember now. I, I was simply aware of the ongoing disputes and trying, on, our, on the prosecution tried, side, trying to see if a, a shorter period would be, a, would be possible uh, and, not, and, and essentially having the answer no or not having a response. That's, that's the, 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 the impasse, as it were. Can we deal with it in this way? Um, had the impasse lasted until at least February 2010 when Mr Jenkins himself was asking for this data in order uh, to be able to advise? Yes, but then um, it, it, with the abuse argument um, just before then, the, the post office of, of, its, of its own bat decided to disclose a significant span of data after having no, no, no alternative suggestions from the defence. I appreciate, with hindsight, that's the wrong approach, but one can see the pressures, uh, cost and, and, and time and so forth. Can we go forwards, please, to FUJ Thank you. And if we go to page two, please. <coughs> and scroll down. And scroll down a little further, please. 
a bit more. Um, sorry, can we scroll up a little bit? And again. Thank you. Um, a, a little later in the afternoon, um, Gareth Jenkins emailing um, David Jones and Penny Thomas. Uh, brief responses as follows. I'm not sure I should put them in a witness statement. Um, three. You remember three was the um, originated in your paragraph seven of your advice. Uh, Fujitsu, tell us about any issues or problems acknowledged with Horizon. I'm summarising. Mr Jenkins says... This is where I'm reluctant to make a clear statement. I'm aware of one problem where transactions have been lost, in particular circumstances due to locking issues. When this happens, we have events in the eventing logs to indicate that there was an issue. And whenever we provide transaction logs to the post office, we check for any such events. In the case of West Byfleet, we've not provided any transaction logs, and so have not made this request for the, this che these checks. Did you ever get to see this, that Mr Jenkins was reluctant to make a clear statement over whether there were any problems with Horizon? No. Uh, it, I say no simply because if I'd seen this, I would have realised that there was a problem with dealing with paragraph 7 of my advice. I'd have gone back to that and tried to sort it out, and it, I would have started asking more questions. Perhaps I, sh I should have been pressing it anyway, but um, I, I'm troubled reading this, um, obviously, because it, it, well, this is, this is bound to make me ask questions, and I don't remember seeing this. And, and there's two problems with this paragraph that arise, aren't there? First is the refusal of the person with expertise being reluctant to make a clear statement about whether there are problems with Horizon. And secondly, in any event, saying that he's aware of a problem where transactions have been lost. And we can't tell at the moment whether this afflicted West Byfleet because we haven't uh, got the data, and therefore we haven't made the checks. Yes, and, and it's unclear to me what this problem is. It seems to be a different problem of which I've not been made aware. Can we go to poll Just dealing with it from the top, we can see that it's sent by Mr. Singh. I think that's his PA or assistant, Marilyn Benjamin, um, to you on the 8th of February. We were looking at an email chain of the 5th of February. Uh, Warwick and John, for your information and comments. And then if we scroll down. Um, Jarnell, this is an email I received earlier from Gareth. You'll see that he is clear that in order to answer Council's question about any issues, he needs to be able to check the underlying transaction logs to be able to say whether there were any issues. On the specific issues you, uh, you raise, Gareth's view is two. He needs information and time to research the background to this case before providing any response. And then three, cutting in what has been said, he is not currently in a position to make a clear statement. It's possible for there to be problems where transactions have been lost uh, due to locking issues, etc. So it does look, Mr. Tapp, no, as, I agree. I... As, it, as if this has been um, uh, forwarded to you. Well, I have to accept that. I don't remember seeing this, but it's obviously something I've missed. Um, if I'd 
Um, it's my fault. I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't remember seeing this. It would have made me ask questions. And so do you um, agree that you were on notice uh, from your solicitors that Mr Jenkins had explained that there could be uh, locking errors in Horizon which would cause transactions to be lost? Well, yes, I've been put... Uh, clearly, I've obviously missed this, sir, and haven't, haven't taken it on board. And would you agree that um, this chain was forwarded to you in direct response to Mr Longman's translation of your paragraph 7 of your advice? Yes, I think it, I, I think it was. I think it follows from you not um, remembering having received this. You can't help us as to what your response was to learning that the man with expertise, Mr Jenkins, felt unable currently to make a clear statement as to whether or not there were problems or issues with Horizon. Yes. And you can't help us with what your response was to knowledge that there was a problem with Horizon, according to the man with expertise, of lost transactions? Well, no, I, I, I can't remember this. So, um, I don't know if it appears later on. It's obviously something I've missed. I haven't remembered this at all. Or well, don't remember seeing this at all. And if I had seen it and thought it through, I would have taken action. I think it follows that if you um, had realised the significance of what was being said to you in this paragraph here, you would realise the need to advise the post office to take steps to meet its disclosure obligations in relation to this issue. Yes. For example, what was the nature of the issue, what was the scope of the issue, what was its severity, and how that information ought to be provided to the defence? No, absolutely. And overall, would you agree that this chain shows that Mr Jenkins did say, at this point in time, he was unable to make a clear statement about Horizon not having problems? Well, yes. Um, I suspect. I mean, if I if I was reading this document, if I hadn't quite cross referred it with other documents, that may have been the error. But it's obviously something I've missed, and um, this 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 is important, and I've missed it. I'm sorry about that. Can we turn, please, to FUJ 0012 2808? And we're moving forwards, if we look at the um, time at the top of that email, to uh, 2.33 on the 8th of February. Um, Mr Jenkins sends through to John L. Singh, copying Penny Thomas and David Jones, a new witness statement saying what I don't know about Falkirk and also comments on the third report, commenting, I doubt if they're much use without getting the various... Um, detailed logs. And can we look at the attached statement, please? At poll four zeros one five six nine. Uh, this is the attachment to that email, Mr. Jenkins' witness statement, then dated the eighth of February, two thousand. In the second paragraph, he says, I've been asked if issues found at Calendar Square at Post Office in Falkirk could have caused the discrepancies in the case of Seaman Misera. At this stage, I'm not aware of the details of the problems in Calendar Square Post Office in Falkirk. However, I expect to be able to find out the details of that case and also to compare the failing scenarios with the detailed logs that are to be extracted for the Seaman Misera case and then should be able to make clear if the scenario is um, relevant. And then the rest of 
um, the, the statement consists of a number of other references to the fact that the post office hadn't made any requests to Fujitsu for any data relating to West Byfleet that would enable Mr Jenkins to respond to Professor McLachlan's report. Okay? Yes. Uh, can we go to poll 305 4056? Uh, this is an email to you from John L. Singh. Uh, for your information, I attach two statements by Gareth Jenkins, which um, were served on the defence solicitors today by email. And the um, second of those is the 8th of February statement that we've just looked at. And so at this stage, Mr. Jenkins was still saying, and indeed staying, saying in witness statements being served on the defence, I can't respond to the expert, because I haven't got the data. Yes. By this stage, um, uh, a month or so before the anticipated March 2010 trial, do you agree that you had not advised the post office that Mr Jenkins um, ought to be treated as an expert witness? Yes, I, I, I agree. I, I don't think I ever advised that he be an expert witness. It was, I don't remember how it was essentially presented to me, but I don't remember how that came about. It wasn't as a product of my advice, but as I concede, that was down to muddled thinking for which I have to take overall responsibility. Would you agree that by this stage, February 2010, the post office had not sought to instruct Mr Jenkins as an expert witness? That seems to be right, yes. And that none of the statements that Mr Jenkins had provided um, incorporated in any way the necessary inclusions for a statement to amount to expert evidence. I agree, yes, yes. Can we move forwards, please? At poll 309 3946. Um, this is a skeleton <coughs> argument um, settled by. Um, Keith Hadrill on the 24th of February um, 2010 in support of his client's application for a stay of the proceedings um, as an abusive process. Uh, can we uh, just look at paragraph two, please? Um, about five lines in, four lines in, it says trial on count one was fixed to take place on the 30th of May 2009, as we know but was stood out on the day on the defence application for inquiries to be made as to the integrity of the Post Office Horizon Computing System, which is central to the prosecution case. And I just want to see what was being argued by the defence by looking at page three, please. And uh, bottom half of the page under trial history. Um, paragraph four repeats what we've um, just read. Uh, paragraph five listed for PTR and directions on the 14th of July, directions are given, which included the service of experts' reports. Uh, do you recall that, that at a, a PTR, um, there was a direction made for the service of expert reports, plural? Yes, no, but I think there's an attendance date for that, but I, I, the, um, I can't recall, I call the date of the hearing. I think it was before His Honour Judge Critchlow, I think. The resident judge? Yes. Can you um, recall how you reacted to a, um, an order which directed the service of expert reports by a timetable? and yet the prosecution was not relying on um, an expert? Well, the, the, the trouble, well, I reacted with dismay, I suppose, but the trouble was that um, we were given very strict directions by the courts, and yet it didn't seem to fit with what we were able, going to be able to do in time. It's a product of muddled thinking, but the disclosure requests 
are very wide. Um, we, you've been very properly focusing on the logs, which is, is the key, um, I accept. Uh, but they were much wider than that. And um, <clears throat> I suppose to an extent I, I've, well, it, directions are made for a timetable because the court wants to try and make progress in the case. I probably should have said on that day, we're not going to be able to deal with this. But I was try doing my best to try and keep things going. And paragraph six, the prosecution by letter dated the 14th of um, August 2009 uh, said it would instruct Fujitsu, the supplier and operator of the Horizon system, to assist as experts. In that letter, the prosecution stated that the request for data had been submitted to Fujitsu and acknowledged. And then um, over to page five, please. This is in total contradiction to the statement received from Gareth Jenkins uh, of Fujitsu, who states that no requests have been made for any data relating to the West Byfield branch. I think that was um, accurate. Um, we can skip over um, uh, paragraphs um, at 7, 8, 9, and 10 on this page and go on to um, page 7, please. Uh, paragraph 12. The prosecution had failed until the 1st of February to instruct an expert. At the court hearing on the 1st of February 2010, the prosecution stated it had identified their expert, Gareth Jenkins, from Fujitsu, but not yet instructed him. The court confirmed that the prosecution expert should report by the 8th of February. Um, 30 that, that's seven days. That's, uh, one can see the pressure that's being put on us by the court. It's actually looking at it now, it's completely unrealistic. Um, but I was trying my best, and the prosecution as a whole was trying its best to, to, to keep the trial going and trying to keep to the trial date. But that's looking at that one, and he has to read it to see how unrealistic it is. Would you maintain that position, even if there had been a direction of July of the previous year um, at requiring the service of experts' reports? No, but... This wasn't I, the first time... No, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And I appreciate these are legitimate criticisms... And there has been a lot of muddled thinking, and that is why we ended up having an abusive process argument, and we, we missed the trial date. I accept all that. In paragraph 13, um, uh, Mr Hadrill says, a short statement dated the 8th of February, that's the one we've just looked at, was served from Mr Jenkins in that report. Mr Jenkins generally could not assist because, A, he'd not been given sufficient material and documentation by the prosecution, B, he'd only just been instructed to assist and would need time. C, some of the questions raised by Professor McLachlan he did not understand. D, some of the information requested from Fujitsu should in fact come from the post office. And then he says this, it's apparent that the prosecution has given no clear instructions to its own expert or provided him with adequate material to assist the court. On reflection, would you agree that that's a fair criticism? Yes, and, and I think I agreed that they were fair criticisms in the abuse argument. I'm, my essential argument was to say we, we have to move on and we've found a way to solve these problems. And was the, um, cutting through it, the essential approach taken, um, that, that one sees quite often, these are all issues that can come out in the wash to ensure that a fair trial is achieved? No, I think that's unfair. It's not coming out in the wash. The, a fair trial can be achieved within a reasonable amount of time because what happened after the abuse of process argument was the experts did cooperate cooperated very fully, provided in due course a statement of their agreements and disagreements, and then gave evidence back to back, lasting two days, so the jury, I thought at the time, were given a very full understanding. This, this I, I, the correspondence in this case was very demanding indeed. And essentially, in some of the disclosure requests, we were being asked to look at every single post office. Uh, for all manners, we had to, some of the disclosure requests were so wide, we had to give disclosure of every time there's been an investigation at a post office. Um, there was no focus, and that's what I was trying to, doing my best to try and get a focus. I wanted to get the focus back to West Byfleet, which in fact, Gareth Jenkins is trying to do by saying get, we need the logs. Um, it, it, it was a, 
it was, it was a difficult mess, and I found it a mess, and I found it very difficult. And if that's my weakness and my inability to, get, to cut through all these things, I take full responsibility for it. Can we move on, please, to um, Fujitsu 0015 2996? Uh, so we're now in late February. An email from uh, Mr. Jenkins uh, within Fujitsu. And he's referring to a conversation with you. You're not copied into this email, but I want to ask you about what he says that you said. Uh, following the email exchange um, below, I've now had another call from the post office's prosecution barrister, Warwick Tatford, asking me to do some analysis of the various logs associated with this case. He's going to arrange for me to be sent details of what has been alleged and also what has been admitted so that I can identify some part of the logs to look through and discuss with the defence expert. Even if we limit the scope, this sounds like a very time-consuming task. I'm uh, not sure I really want to be doing that and need some guidance as to the priority of this compared with everything else. Apparently the defence is saying it's too hard to get detailed info and therefore there can't possibly be a fair trial. Post office are keen to counter that argument. Trial date is in two weeks' time, so this is likely to be urgent. What do I do? And who can sort out with the post office exactly what we should and shouldn't be doing um, to um, support this? And so... Um, by this time, you had got Mr. Jenkins' um, phone number, either mobile or, or his desk. And again, th this form of instruction to an oral instruction from prosecution counsel to um, prosecution putative expert witness, was it normal for you in post office cases to work in this way? No, because I'd never been involved in anything like this before. Um, I'd never I'd been involved, although I'd been involved in the case of Page, there was no expert in that case on the prosecution side. This was an entirely new situation for me, uh, and I, I was finding it very difficult and just trying, trying to find a way through to make, uh, to have a practical way forward. And so does it amount to this, that the defence had identified that the post office had failed to provide Mr Jenkins with any material? And then Mr. Jenkins is now speaking with you about what should happen. Well, as a, as a way to try and make progress, because at the moment, we, Mr. Jenkins had no idea what to look for. So we were discussing think, ways of looking at the logs to, to see if problems could be identified. It was a way of thinking it through. Would you agree that this doesn't amount to any sort of proper expert instruction? I do agree with that. But I also s suggest that this isn't a case where um, the, the disclosure requests were very wide and going beyond the ordinary case where we'd have one expert on, on each side. Uh, there'd been a lack of focus and it caused confusion. And I was obviously a victim of the confusion as well. And I, uh, well, I've obviously made a lot of mistakes. I acknowledge that. Um, can we move forward, please, to poll 3054213? So within a couple of hours of the email that we were just looking at, at um, uh, just after four on the same day, Mr. Jenkins is emailed by Mr. Singh saying, as per discussions, I now enclose copy case summary, copy indictment, copy defence statement, copy of the interview. Mm -hmm. uh, copy defence expert's name is um, Charles McClacken. Um, important that we're proactive on this and you contact him as soon as possible with a view to concluding this. And then some uh, words of thanks. Um, is this the closest that we get to a formal instruction by the post office of um, Mr. J 
Jenkins? Yes, I think it, it probably is. It's certainly the only... Um, yes, I suppose it must be. It's the only printed um, form of instruction that I've seen. But in reality, it doesn't amount to a proper instruction of Mr Jenkins as an expert witness? Yes. And in particular, on the um, question of a joint meeting with Professor McLachlan, it doesn't provide any sort of instruction as to how Mr Jenkins was supposed to undertake such a joint expert meeting? No. Um, well, I don't know what other... If, I don't, there's no evidence from what I can see of any other communications between John L. Singh and, uh, and Mr. Jenkins, so um, it, doesn't, it appears from this that he's not been given all the information he needs. Um, he's not being given the, the assistance he needs. Can we go forwards, please? Um, uh, a couple of days later, poll double O, sorry, treble O five, four two six seven. First of March, John L. Singh to Gareth Jenkins. I now enclose defence experts' fourth and fifth reports after his conversation with you of the 12th of February. As you are our Horizon expert, capital H, capital E, you need to telephone Charles McLachlan. His mobile telephone number is to arrange a meeting where you can discuss all of his reports and his concerns about Horizon so you can deal with it and rebut it, which you've done in your long telephone conversation about his various hypotheses and then write a detailed report which would go um, some way to progressing and concluding this matter, and importantly, preserving the horizon system. Uh, importantly, preserving the horizon system. Um, was that a feature of um, the instructions that you received, that the evidence in the case should have as its aim the preservation of the integrity uh, of the horizon system? No, not, not that I received. No, I can see what it says here. And clearly, um, this is not an open-minded enough um, set of instructions. Um, there's much more to it than preserving. It's about ensuring that Mrs. Miser has a fair trial. Um, but I wasn't... I wasn't under any pressure from what I feel, from what I remember, that I was being essentially being told to arrange things so that we preserve the horizon system. Um, but I, don't, I didn't feel that, that that was pressure being put on me. Obviously, these words show um, thinking that's, that's, that's not conducive to a, a fair analysis. Anyway... Um this may be the second of um, the two emails that we're looking at that comes closest to an instruction of Mr um, Jenkins. Um, Mr Singh continues, maybe the simplest and practical way of dealing with this whole question is to find uh, the shortest span of logs, analyse it, disprove or rebut what the defence expert is saying in his reports, do you agree that's an inappropriate instruction to Yes, that, that's, that's, that's completely wrong. Um, and then I think the closest that we ever come to a reminder of uh, um, an expert's duties, just a reminder, you're an expert for Fujitsu. You'll be giving evidence in court. The judge and jury will be listening to you very carefully, and a lot will hang on the evidence. It, it's... it's um, Risible? Well, disastrous, was I was going to say. Um, I'm sorry, this shouldn't have happened. Um, and I don't... This, this isn't what I intended to happen, but I, I, that's not an excuse, because as far as I'm concerned, I was prosecution counsel in the case. I, I have responsibility for the case as a whole, and this is, I have obviously failed to ensure that there's an atmosphere where an expert can be properly instructed and wrong decisions are being taken, and I understand the evidence about 
post office not being aware of its duties in relation to expert evidence, and this is the natural result. I wasn't, I don't think I was aware of this sort of instruction. Um, I like to think if I'd seen it, I would have done my very best to sol resolve this and, and put an end to this, but it's, it's, um, it's very troubling reading. Can we move um, forwards to um, two days later, the 3rd of March, um, FUJ 0015-3027. And um, so if we scroll down, we can see to start with an email um, from um, John L. Singh, or on behalf of John L. Singh, to Penny Thomas. Yes? Yes. And if we just look at the top of the email chain, we can see um, Penny Thomas sending it on to Gareth Jenkins. Yes? Yes. And I appreciate in these emails that I'm showing you more recently, you're not a, a copyee, and so far as I can see, you weren't um, sent these. This is all going on beneath the surface. Um, so if we just scroll down to see what John L. Singh said to uh, Penny uh, Thomas, which got forwarded to Gareth Jenkins. Uh, what has been requested is transaction logs for West Byfleet. Uh, this is the whole of the false accounting period which Ms. Uh, Misra has pleaded guilty to from the 1st of December 2006 to the 31st of December 2007. The, this should then be given to Gareth Jenkins at Fujitsu to confirm by his witness statement whether there are any errors within the Horizon system for the transaction log period. Gareth Jenkins will need to study the defence expert's report, which he has in hand, and he's had lengthy discussions with the defence expert, Charles McLachlan. There's a need for an urgent meeting. Um, next paragraph, maybe the practical approach for Gareth is to find the shortest period span of transaction log data, etc. So the cutting and pasting into this email of that which we'd seen before. So this amounts perhaps to the third instruction to Mr. Jenkins, would you agree? Yes. And in that um, anti-penultimate paragraph, three lines in, it says, Mr. Gareth Jenkins is an expert for, for Fujitsu. He'll give evidence in court. And then the passage about the jury and the judge will be listening very carefully. Do you agree that insofar as it can be said that this document constituted some form of instruction, it was limited to the examination of logs for a specific period to determine whether there was evidence of a problem within that period relating to West Byfleet? Yes. That was, I think, consistent with what you appear to have told Mr. Jenkins to do in your telephone conversation of the 26th. Is that right? Yes. But the bigger task, the paragraph seven uh, of your advice task, appears to have been lost by now, doesn't it? Yes. No, it's... It, it does seem to be, have been completely lost. And we go from a, an expert I understood to be that I wanted to look at the logs with an open mind to being given the instructions we can see here, where it's so, so one-sided and unfair. I'm afraid it betrays a complete lack of understanding of what an expert is for, and um, that's obviously um, very wrong and actually very unhelpful to Mr Jenkins as well. Uh, can, we, um, can I ask, uh, to what extent were you involved in the selection of the date parameters for the ARQ data? I don't think I was involved in... I, I, well, I approved the dates on the basis that it, it was free of the, the thefts. I can't remember now if I, that's something I approved after the event or whether I advised before. I, I'm afraid I can't remember that. Can we look to see whether we can get any uh, help from the skeleton argument that you lodged for the abuse of process argument? Um, that's poll 
Um, if we can look at page five, we can see you sign this off. On the 7th of March. And can we look on page two, please? And paragraph seven at the foot of the page. You say one of the main sticking points in the disclosure process has been the cost of obtaining horizon data. Uh, the defence's request has been for logs from six months prior to the defendant's tenure to the present day. That's far too wide, and the cost of obtaining that data would frankly be astronomical. See paragraph eight for the cost. The Crown's explained on numerous occasions how expensive it is to obtain this material. The expense uh, simply results from Royal Mail's contractual obligations to Fujitsu. We've asked the defence repeatedly to consider a narrow time span for the request for um, their request or a narrow field of types of transactions. The reason for this suggestion was that the defendant's false inflations increased consistently over a long period of time. And then eight, defence has made no proposal as to an appropriate span of data, uh, even though it has the potential advantage of the defendant's insider knowledge. This failure by the defence has been rather frustrating but it may have been in part because the defence put its request on hold whilst it asked for justification of the cost. The Crown has um, therefore chosen at a cost of over £20,000 to obtain logs for the period December 06 to December 07. Uh, the chosen time period covers the full extent of the defendant's admitted false accounting. It also postdates the time when the defendant claims to have put a stop to theft by employees. To what extent here were you... Um, rehearsing your instructions or were you um, rehearsing your own advice or repeating your own advice as to the date parameters well I, I, I can't remember that's the difficulty because it's not in the it's not in a written document so I can't remember I, I can't remember whether this was suggested to me and I approved it, or whether I suggested it. I suspect it's the former, actually, uh, from the wording here, because, um, but, I, but I, I can't remember, I'm afraid. Okay, I understand. Um, can we move forwards, please, to look at Mr. Um, Jenkins' witness statement of the 9th of March, poll 401643. Can you see this is his witness statement of the 9th of March? Yes. And if we just scroll down, please. He says that um, further to the um, two statements that we've seen earlier were served by Mr. Singh on the 8th of February, I'd like to add the following. Um, I've examined the fifth interim technical report, and then he comments on it, and that's how the statement proceeds. If we just go to the top, please. This is in um, Criminal Justice Act form, isn't it? It's an, an MG11, if it was a, yes. a police case format. How is it, if by this time the, uh, m that Mr Jenkins was being treated as an expert witness, that he was giving um, his evidence by way of a Criminal Justice Act, a Section 9 witness statement that doesn't comply with either the common law or the criminal procedure rules for well, expert evidence? That was, I, I think, follows from my advice that, that his responses to the expert, which are meant to assist rather than being a formal report. Um, the, these are served evidence in the case. Well, they are served evidence, and I suggest to put in a witness statement. What I should have done was, 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 was to say, oh, actually, the time has clearly come where it needs to be set out more clearly as an expert's report. But... Um, my advice was given in order to speed matters along. Um, it clearly wasn't the right advice. Can we move forwards to July um, 2010, please, and look at FUJ 
And um, oh, can we look at the second page, please? And scroll down. And scroll down, please. Thank you. Can you see there an email of the 22nd of July, 2010, sent at 7.30 in the morning by the defence solicitor, Izzy Hogg? Yes. To the prosecution solicitor, Mr Singh, um, in the case of Misra. John L, as a result of the meeting that took place between Charles McLachlan and Gareth Jenkins, as directed at, uh, by the judge, we now need to have, one, access to the system in the Midlands where it appears there are live reproducible errors. Two, access to the operations at Chesterfield to understand how reconciliation and transaction corrections are dealt, dealt with. And three, access to the system change requests, known error log, and new release documentation to understand what problems have had to be fixed. So this is a, um, a defence um, chopping list or request for disclosure arising out of an expert meeting. You'll see that it includes known error logs. Can we um, scroll up, please? Uh, Mr um, Singh forwards that um, email to you um, and to the investigator, Mr Longman. I enclose a copy of an email received from Izzy Hogg. Content is self-explanatory. Can you please be kind enough to let me have your urgent instructions as to the access and information she's requesting in respect of the system in the Midlands, the operation at Chesterfield and the error logs. Uh, he'll contact Gareth to find out what happened at the meeting with Charles. I think it follows from this that the evidence you gave earlier that you hadn't heard of known error logs must be a... Um, in error well, uh, after all this time? Well, yes, precisely. I mean, it, it is a long time ago. Just scrolling down, if you um, at the time had seen an email such as this, would um, known error log have jumped out at you as having um, a special significance? Or would it be just one of another species of material no, it should have it should have leapt out to me because it, the very words have that objective quality that I was seeking, um, and um, I suspect I, in, in considering this, I've been blinded by the first two requests, which are which are, 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 are less obviously uh, important for the trial. So, scrolling back up, then. Thank you. We see that it was sent to you um, five days later on the 27th of July. And then scroll up again, please. Um, Mr Longman sends it on to Fujitsu through Penny Thomas. Uh, could you ask Gareth to explain in more detail how the three points raised by Izzy Hulk below came about? And then scroll up. And again, and again. We can see um, Penny Thomas's reply to Mr Longman. And uh, she says she's had a conversation with Gareth. And his views on the email string are as follows. And this is essentially an email cut in to her email. I'm going to skip one and two, which is about access to the system. Three, system change requests. Basically, he was asking to look at all system faults. I suggested that as we um, kept all testing and live faults in the same system, and that there were around 200,000 of them, then this wasn't going to get him far. He then suggested looking at system changes and would like to see all changes that have happened to the system. Again, I don't think this would help. I don't know how practical it is for Fujitsu's release management to provide that. I think all we can do is ask the question. Do you see what this overlooks is a response by Mr Jenkins to, well, when I say overlooks, I put that, um, does not include, putting it very neutrally, any response to um, the request for known error logs? Yes. Would you agree this isn't really a response of substance to 
to the defence disclosure requests, is it? No, it's, it's, well, it's not properly thought through, I agree. Can we go, please, to poll 305, 5073? We can see that that email of 3.39 on the 27th from Longman to Singh was almost immediately, so eight minutes later, um, sent on to you. Does it follow that you didn't pick up that the defence were asking for something of potential significance, known error logs, the type of material that you were looking for, some objective recognition? Yes, of I fault? agree. Um, precisely and that um, Mr Jenkins had not answered that question? Yes, no, I agree. Can you recall what your response was to what was said, that there were some 200,000 system faults in Horizon? Could I, could I just, could just be scrolled down? Because yeah, I scroll can't down. See it in front of mine. That's it. It's a paragraph three, the, the cut-in part of the email. Well, I haven't. I, I obviously haven't considered this this properly because that's. I can't see, Mr. Tapford, any follow-on advice from this. No, I know. I know. Um, I, I think t t telling the post office the steps that it needed to take to ensure that it met its disclosure obligations by reference to what is disclosed by paragraph three. No, I, I agree. I haven't, I haven't thought this through. I've, I've, I think I've been distracted by the other requests um, and haven't thought this through. I'm sorry. So I wonder whether that would be um, an appropriate moment to take a break. So I wonder whether that would be an appropriate moment to take a break. We can't hear you at the moment. Um, um, I think you're saying yes. You are. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Can we say um, again by nonverbal communication, five to three, please? Thank you very much. Five to three. So good afternoon. Can you see and hear me? I can, uh, much to my relief, um, and I should explain that um, just as you were asking me to break, um, the battery in my mouse ran out, and so I couldn't unmute myself, but I managed to um, cure that. There's a number of quips I could make there, sir, but I'll, um, <laughs> I'll resist yeah. the temptation. Um, yes, I'm, shall we say, nervous about... Um, some aspects of not being with you, Mr. Beer. Yes. Um, Mr. Um, Tapford, we were looking at um, the email exchange of the 27th of July that was forwarded to you um, by Mr. Singh for your information and consideration. Um, can we look at, at what happened when you got it, i.e. the next day, the 28th of July, 2010, by looking at poll 305 Five one one eight. Poll three zero five five double one eight. So this is the day after you were forwarded the email exchange containing the three Izzy Hog disclosure requests, two about access to systems, the third about a variety of things, including um, system change requests and known error logs. And Mr. Jenkins' reply, including the, um, there are 200,000 system faults. Uh, the attendance note is um, one telephone call received from Warwick Tatford 
after discussion, he confirmed that, that they, I think that's the defence, are seeking exactly what they were seeking before, and to respond to the defence that if they wished disclosure of these items, they need to make a section, section 8 application to the court, and also that our expert, Mr Jenkins, has informed their expert that the material from Chesterfield, uh, that is the logs, is not relevant information that would um, assist them I suspect you no longer remember this telephone conversation. No. But the gist of it is that uh, what the defence was now seeking, the Izzy Hogg email request, was what they were seeking before. That, that's in fact not correct, is it? Well, I think it's... I think I'm concentrating on the first two requests. And... Um, well, not deliberately ignoring, but um, missing the third one, which is actually the one that really matters. But it's uh, clearly, I, I mean, I'm not, I've no reason to suggest, to think that this, this is an inaccurate in any way. Why, why would um, disclosure of the known error logs require a defence Section 8 application? Well, no, that wouldn't. That's precisely the point I make, I'm trying to make. That, 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 that I think I'm, I'm presuming that I'm, I'm referring to the first two. So um, request for an access to another site in the Midlands, request for access to Chesterfield. Um, that's, I think, what I've thought of in relation to a Section 8 application. I've obviously missed the third one. And the third one, as I've just said, um, that's primary disclosure, the first one. That's exactly what I said I was looking for, and now I've obviously failed in my own test, and I apologise for that. Can we go to poll 3055126? Um, this is to, um, from John L. Singh, on the 28th of July 2010, it's sent um, to Hannah Ivory, who's another solicitor in the defence firm. Um, I refer you to Miss Izzy Hogg's email of the 22nd of July 2010. These have been previously requested by you, and our view is consistent. The prosecution do not have, um, I, th I think the word an is missing, an obligation to grant you access um, and then I think that is missing, that you require, or are not prepared to disclose this material. However, you're perfectly entitled to make a Section 8 application to the court. And you accept that Mr Singh's response to Miss, Mrs Misra's solicitors reflects the um, advice that you're recorded as given, giving on the Section Oh, day. yes, and, and it reflects what I just, the answer I gave previously. Um, and, and so here, the... Um, important parts of the defence disclosure request have been overlooked. I'd agree with that. Well, what, what, I certainly agree with it now. Um, the problem that I faced throughout this case um, was that there were so many uh, disclosure requests, and um, I've obviously um, made mistakes, but I'm not... That's the context. That's all I'm trying to say. I, I, as I said earlier, I... You've just shown that I failed my own test. Can um, we turn then to um, uh, Mr Jenkins' draft witness statements of October 2010? That can come down. Before we look at them, um, would you agree that um, by 2010 there was a uh, requirement under the Code of Practice issued under the uh, Criminal Procedure Investigations Act 1996 to retain and record final versions of witness statements and draft versions of witness statements where their content differs from the final version? Well, I think that is right. Um, whether I applied that to my mind, I rather doubt from what I know, what I know of um, the, the, the notes and suggestions. But um... I'm reading from paragraph 5.1 of the... Oh, I'm quite happy to accept it. The 2005 no, edition. I, no, I do accept it. I, I can see um, thinking things through where I'm going to be at fault. I accept, I, I accept it says that, and I 
except being aware of it, I think. But um, yes. Can we um, turn with that in mind, the duty to retain drafts where contents differ from the final version and record them on a schedule of unused material to what became Mr. Jenkins' October 2010 witness statement? Uh, can we look, please, at um, FUJ 0012 3006? Can you see this is a draft witness statement dated the 6th of October 2010 um, in Mr. Jenkins' name? And if we scroll down, please. And again, and then look at page two. And then scroll down. Can you see in the second paragraph there, Mr. Jenkins writes, um, in section 1.2 of his report, Professor McClacken lists a number of hypothetical issues with the horizon system. However, there doesn't appear to be a thorough justification as to why these might be relevant. And then there's some text that appears after it which in the original was read. Oh, I see, yes, I understand. Can you see? Yes. I wonder whether that can be marked up, the I wonder if you might be. And the rest of that paragraph, down to hypotheses at all. Thank you. So what happened was Mr. Jenkins' draft statement was sent to you for comment, and you replied, and these are your replies. Yes in um, what was originally read? Yes. Uh, can you um, see there that Mr Jenkins said there doesn't appear to be a thorough justification as to why these issues listed by Professor McClacken might be relevant? And you said, I wonder if you might be prepared to use slightly stronger wording there doesn't appear to be any evidential basis for the hypotheses at all. Yes? Yes. Can we move forwards, please, to page eight? Um, can we see on page eight, the red text beginning with, can you expand on this? So Professor McClacken explores um, issues with training of users in section 2.3.4 of his report. I support his finding regarding discrepancies in cash in almost every period. And then um, you added, can you expand on this and explain in layman's terms, uh, perhaps giving a couple of examples? I do not understand exactly what Professor McClacken is referring to, and your agreement might be interpreted as a concession that the Crown's case is entirely flawed. Discrepancies are always to be expected. Yes? And then if we yeah. carry on reading, scroll down, please. Towards the end of the red section, beginning with M, M seem, I wonder if this could be highlighted, M seems surprised that thefts over a long period should go undiscovered. Uh, you wrote, this is rubbish. If a sub-postmaster is cooking the books, only an audit will reveal the truth. And then can we go forward to page 10, please? Uh, second line onwards and it's the entirety of this paragraph. Please provide your full explanation 
of why calendar square doesn't apply so that this statement can stand alone. The defence are going to bang on about this. And then five lines on. My understanding is that Misra is unable to describe at all what may have been going wrong with her system. According to her defence statement, she simply put the losses down to theft by employees and our incompetence. This appears to me to be ludic ludicrously vague. She should at least be able to say where the losses were occurring. Are you not surprised that Mr. McClack Professor McClacken's reports appear to have received no guidance whatsoever from Misra? Were you surprised to see that the calendar square was still an issue for Professor McClacken? Did you have any idea that he wanted the earlier logs before you received his final report? Uh, page 13. Uh, top part, finally towards the end of the section, Professor McClacken hypothesizes um, there are missing transaction corrections which would reduce the cash balance expected by the Horizon system, i.e. be in favour of MISRA. And Mr Jenkins said this may indeed be true. And then you said, if this can be highlighted, why? Isn't this wishful thinking by Professor McClacken? There's no evidential basis whatsoever for his assertion. Have the transaction corrections disappeared by magic? However, my understanding is that normally, and I think that's um, back to Mr. Jenkins' writing. And then further down the page, um, Mr. Jenkins writes, section 5.2 .2 of the report discusses remittances. However, I don't understand the relevance of this discussion to the case. Professor McClacken mentions that my analysis identified a pattern or remittance transactions which is consistent with Misra's statement that she declared cash held in remittance pouches in the safe, which were not actually present. Uh, Mr Jenkins continues, in my view, is this not an indication of guilt? And you added, please rephrase and expand. It's surely surprising that a sub-postmaster should go to all the trouble of preparing scores of empty bags rather than trying to find out what the problem was. In fact, Misra had considerable computer experience. You may want to speak to John Longman as to her um, CV. And then lastly, page 14, uh, foot of the page. Section 3.2 mentions uh, screen calibration issues. Well, I can't, um, I think that's supposed to say 100% rule out such issues causing some losses. However, I can see how this could account for something like the full extent of the losses. You added, please rephrase. This will be taken as a damaging concession. You need to explain what is meant by screen calibration issues. Give simple examples, if you can. How can any such issue lead to a deficiency? Above, you only refer to the possibility of confusion arising, not a deficiency. Thank you. That can come down here. Mr. Tapford, um, is what we see here prosecution counsel seeking, seeking to harden up his expert? Well, I'm seeking um, him to consider um, various points, uh, points that I see as legitimate, um, and uh, I was trying to express it in a, in a way that merely in, to invite further consideration, but I, I, it, I, I'm asking him to focus on what I understand to be the evidence. Would you agree that the way you went about it was inappropriate? <coughs> in the context of everything that we've gone through, um, I, I, sh I, I, I should have acted differently, I think. I think it's, um, I think I may have been lulled into feeling that your experts are cooperating and I was merely clarifying details to make sure that Mr. Jenkins really meant what he said. Um, but. It all, it all comes back to the safeguards that are there in the criminal procedure rules that they should have been followed. And um, 
But here, this isn't about um, just the rules. This is about what you personally did. Oh, yes. No, I agree. It's, um... You ask questions in a very leading way, don't you, in this? You point out what your view is. I do. I do. It's, it's, I, I should have been... Um, I should have handled it differently. Consistently with the criminal procedure rules, do you agree that this draft statement marked up by you should have been retained and recorded on a schedule of unused material? Yes, I think that's right, and that's something I didn't consider. I obviously wasn't thinking these things through at all. I'm sorry for that. And thirdly, do you agree as a consequence that the defence at trial were denied the opportunity to explore with Mr Jenkins how his written evidence came to look as it did at trial if the facts of this exercise and the records of it were not revealed to the defence and to the court? Well, that, that would follow. I, but, um, I, I... Would you agree that that is not only a breach of the rules, but an unfairness in itself? No, I think it is unfair, and I, I, I'm sorry for that. I can... Um, I think what I was doing was just trying to clarify matters and make things clear. But I, I, I do agree that, that I've overstepped the mark there. You said in your witness statement that you were at pains throughout to ensure that Mr Jenkins understood that he was subject to a duty of independence, uh, that he was the subject of a duty to be impartial, and that he was under a duty to assist the court and not the post office. Do you think that the approach that we see in the examples I've given you of trying to press Mr Jenkins to say that it was likely that Mrs Misra had stolen the money is consistent with those claims that you've made? No, I, I, I accept that, that, that it isn't. But um, what I was trying to do in my witness statement was remember the overall picture, which I did think, genuinely thought, involved mutual cooperation and um, trying to focus on, on, on the issues. But, um, well, I've, I've summarised matters in that way, in a way that's, that's, that makes me appear better than I clearly have been. I, I accept those failings. You've rightly pointed them out. And finally, on this topic, um, do you see any inconsistency with your view that Mr Jenkins was called at trial as an expert witness? and your approach, as disclosed by this marked-up witness statement, of seeking to push the independent expert to take a more unequivocal view in his witness statement? I'm seeking to push... I was seeking to push him on, on, on the issues and to focus clearly on the issues. Um, But I, I, I agree. I sh I, looking at it now, I, 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 sh I don't think I should have done it. Can we look at um, now what Mr Jenkins did in response to some of the comments that you made? Um, poll going to be very difficult to read because um, there are four colours going on um, um, in it. Um, this is essentially a, um, a version of Mr Jenkins' October 2010 witness statement returned by him to you and the prosecution team, setting out amendments that he'd made which are um, coloured in red when he makes an addition are struck through and coloured in red when he makes a deletion, and then including in a box, which sets out in um, yellow and sometimes blue, his um, response to your comments. 
So can we look, please, as an example, the bottom of page five. And it, I wonder whether we can display the text at, just at the top of page six too. So we can see what your comment was, WT, Warwick Tatford. I wonder if you might be prepared to use slightly stronger wording. There doesn't appear to be any evidential basis for the hypotheses at all. Gareth Jenkins, is that better? And then if we go up to see what changes he made. Originally as drafted, the sentence read, however, there doesn't appear to be a justification as to why these might be relevant. It's been changed to, however, there doesn't appear to be any real justification as to why these might be relevant. The purpose of these statements appears to, to be to plant seeds of doubt without a factual basis. So you see, he's picked up your point. There isn't any factual basis for this. Yes? Yes. And then can we look, please, at um, the bottom of page 16? Thank you. Uh, WT, uh, can you expand on this and explain in layman's terms, etc.? We just read that. Yep. In the in the previous marked up version. Yeah. And then scroll down to see what um, his reply is. Uh, Gareth Jenkins, I'm not sure I can cover all you suggest. but have made an attempt above. And we can see, if we go up to page 16, keep going, keep going. The entirety of that page is new text, yes? Yes. And if we can go um, um, on to page 17, please and scroll down. Uh, WT, if we just scroll up a little bit, thank you. WT, um, isn't theft rather more likely? Are these equally valid possibilities? Why would a sub postmaster not monitor the system well on a daily basis? Not to do so risks throwing their own money down the drain. Gareth Jenkins, I would tend to agree, but surely that's something for the post office to show. My expertise is in the system and not in how a post office is operated. So this is the expert pushing back on you, isn't he? Yes, he is. At bottom of page 24, please. And on to page 25. Thank you. Uh, WT, please rephrase and expand. It's surely surprising that a sub-postmaster should go to all the trouble of preparing scores of empty bags rather than trying to find out what the problem was. In fact, Misra had considerable experience. You may want to speak to John Longman as to her CV. Reply, I've tried to do that. Not sure what the relevance of the CV is to me. I'm just trying to describe how Horizon works, not her competency. Again, Mr Jenkins pushing back. Yes, to his credit. Uh, bottom of page 25, please. Um, WT, as I mentioned above, if the sub-postmaster is fiddling the accounts, only an audit will uncover the problem. Misra would have known this. Gareth Jenkins agree, but it's not for me to say. Again, pushback by Mr Jenkins. Yes, no, Absolutely. That can come down, thank you. Overall, it seems, would this be right, that you were trying materially to alter the content of Mr Jenkins' evidence, and in some cases you succeeded, and in other cases he stood his ground? Would you agree? I wouldn't agree to materially to alter the content. I was asking him to focus on, on issues as I understood them to be, albeit the, the, the distinction's quite narrow. 
Um, looking at it now, I, 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 if I was doing it now, I wouldn't have done it in that way. I, I think, I think it's dealing with a, a different, a, a new and uh, what, what was for me an unusual case, and I, I think I haven't thought things through properly, and that's my error, and um, I, 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 I apologise for it. Thank you. Can we turn to a new topic, please? Um, disclosure of training material. Can we just turn up your witness statement, please? Um, at, at paragraph 50, which is on page 25. And if we look at, um, in fact, it's the second part of page, uh, paragraph 50 on page 26. You're referring to um, Mrs. Misra's interview, and you say, on the contrary, she said she'd been able to find the causes of the losses, her dishonest employees. Uh, her interview had not made mention of her suffering losses right from the beginning in the presence of her trainers whilst they were training her before any possible theft was in, uh, involved, which was something that she later relied on heavily in her evidence at trial. So the point that you're making here is this right, that at trial, Mrs. Misra relied on an occasion or occasions where a loss was suffered whilst a trainer was in the premises with her, in the post office with her. Yes. And you're making the point, but hold on, that's not something that she relied on in interview. Well, she, uh, I think she... Uh, I dealt with this... I specifically went, well, my normal practice is to go specifically to the questions to see whether it's a matter that could legitimately be raised at that time. But um, I, I, I'm trying to remember exactly how it was. I appreciate I made the point and that, um, that, that, that I made that point in, in my speech and then persuaded the judge um, that there was a potential adverse inference on that point. So a Section 34 inference yes. against her. But in any event, you're making the point here that Mrs. Misra relied significantly on the fact uh, that um, some of the losses occurred in the presence of her trainer. Yes. Um, I just want to look at uh, what was disclosed in the trial um, as against material that the inquiry has now uncovered. Oh, right. All right. Um, the post office has disclosed to us that the following document... Um, it's called a request for ad hoc training, specifically in relation to balancing procedures. Can we look at it, please? Um, poll 3047578. Can you see it's called request for ad hoc training? Yes name of the outlet, West Byfleet, and its um, identification code. Um, agent's name, misspelt Mrs. Misra. Yes. And then if we scroll down, ad hoc training required, balancing procedures. Yes. yes. Um, training delivery team to complete at the foot of the page. Request received, 25th of July, 2005. Days allocated, 27th of July and Wednesday, the 3rd of August, 2005. The trainer, uh, Michael Opa B.E. Yes? Yes. And then if we just look at the rest of the page. Balancing procedure. Um... This is for the field trainer to complete. Balancing procedure, topic covered, check daily procedures, weekly procedures, weekly horizon reports, and cash account. So it looks like there have been a request for ad hoc training, specifically in relation to balancing procedures, that looks like it led to Michael Opabie being allocated to perform training on the 27th of July and the 3rd of August. Yes. And so overall, this is a request for training relating to Mrs. Misra 
specifically relating to balancing, yes? Yes. Can we look, please, at poll 306 5114? Um, an intervention manager visit log. Um, this looks like it's completed by the intervention manager for the area called um, Alan Ridout. And he's recorded the branch was visited on the 10th, 17th and 22nd of August 2005 regarding balancing issues and the setting up of individual stock units. I've spent many hours sorting out balancing issues and helping with the stock set up as well as arranging ad hoc training. Sub postmaster still new, new and looking for support on many issues. She has the capability but needs occasional guidance. And then this, if we can just scroll down and highlight it. The branch is currently holding a loss of £466.73 and an over of £96.80. That was put into the suspense account by the trainer, Michael, who told the sub-postmaster that a voucher would be issued to clear it. I've spoken to Michael, who confirmed he did this. I've warned the sub-postmaster that unless an error comes back, they could be liable. Would you agree that this appears to be a record, that whilst a trainer was there, he agreed that an amount of £466.73 and an over of £96.80 could be put in a suspense account? Yes, no, it does. Could I just clarify, it's my, me not understanding this. Was this something that was disclosed in the trial, or has it has come forward more recently? More recently. Oh, well, it, it looks, rather looks like I've made an error and a bad, unfair point. Um, uh, you're ahead of me, um, because I think you're thinking ahead to the cross-examination yes. of Mrs. Misra, um, when essentially you said that what she was saying wasn't true. Yes, and it, it looks like a bad point. I'm sorry about that. I, my understanding was, from what I remember, the training records were disclosed. Well, let's, um, let's before we get ahead of us. Forgive ourselves, me, I'm getting ahead of my, my fault, I'm sorry. Just see how disclosure unfolded at the um, trial. Can we look, please, at poll 305-8503? Can we see at the foot of this page... Um, an email of the 28th of November 2009 from Keith Hadrill to you. Hi Warwick, sorry to disturb your weekend. Um, here with the further disclosure request drafted by Izzy. Call me if any clarification is needed. And then um, if we can look at the disclosure request. Uh, next page please. and look under uh, the foot of the page, under the cross-heading training, uh, copy of the training manual, when it was supplied, all records provided to the defendant, qualifications of the trainer, and then this at paragraph five. During the second week of the defendant's tenure as a sub-postmistress at West Byfleet, the trainer was present during the weekly reconciliation. He called the helpline to request um, explanation as to a loss, as in his opinion, the defendant had at all times followed procedure. No explanation was given, and the defendant made good the loss. Please provide the following information, uh, the name and contact details of that trainer. To assist in identification, the defendant recalls his name was Michael, and he was black. Uh, B, what inquiries were made, bearing in mind the request came from a trainer as to the cause of the loss. If we go back to page one, please. You forwarded this, so you were getting it directly from Defence Council. 
you forwarded it that night, so the following night, um, to John Longman and uh, Phil Taylor. Dear John and Phil, please find yet another disclosure request from the defence, albeit to an extent a rehash of what has gone before. Does um, the language you've used there reflect your frustration at the defence making disclosure requests? Yes. Not, not the act of making disclosure requests. That's not a problem. The problem was their wideness, uh, and they were very wide. And they... they well, the, the trouble with very wide defence request, requests that don't focus on matters is that, that it, it, it's possible to be distracted by some things and not concentrate on other more important things. That's a potential danger. The good prosecutor should be able to deal with everything. But um, there, 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 were a lot of there were a lot of disclosure requests, as, 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 as I think is clear from the paperwork. And they were very wide. That one we've looked at was pretty specific, wasn't it? In the oh, yes, but it's one of the ones. And I think I dealt with that in my advice. And I think John Longman was providing information on that. It may be that he didn't disclose, it wasn't aware of the full information when we made disclosure, but I'm sure we'll come to that. Can we look at what happened at trial, please? UKGI 00001. Four eight four five, and uh, so this is the transcript of the trial for the eighteenth of October two thousand and ten. And if we can turn up page fifty two, please. Um, I, I'm, I'm jumping right in here. This is her evidence in chief. Um, what happened whilst um, Mrs. Michael, whilst Michael was there? Did he also sit behind and watch what you were doing? And Mrs. Misner says, "Yeah, he was sitting behind me. I mentioned to him as he come in, how is it going?" I said, "Not good. I'm having to put money in every day to the post office." He was more concerned than Junaid. He said, "That should not be happening. Let's see how it goes." Question. Uh, did it get any better? No, I have to gain money, so I have to again put money in every day. And then when balancing with Michael, it came round £400 short. But question at the end of the week, and then scroll down. Um, end of uh, D, uh, second balancing office with Michael. So the first day with Michael on the second week, is that right? Uh, that is right, no, yeah, that's right. It's £400 short. No, no, that is on the second balance, £400 short. So that's at the end of the second week. Yes, end of the second week. Did you um, get any corrections there? No, Michael said it's a bit unusual. I know you have been doing the transaction correctly. Then I remember him staying behind and he made a phone call from my office. Um, he said he'd been observing. We were doing the transaction correctly. Um, They've been putting the money in every day to balance the till and he can't understand why the £400 shortfall is. So she was showing quite um, a good recall for the figures there, the £400, wasn't she? Yes. Can we go forwards to page 132, please? Um... At B, um, it is this interview I'm looking at, right, this is you cross-examining, all right, okay. Question, in this interview, you've not mentioned Michael Junaid, what the auditor threatened you with, the £500 and you'll lose the office. You don't mention Tamiko Springer. Yes, all those things are missing from this interview. Do you accept that? Um, I accept I gave the answers, that gave answer to the questions what they asked for. Um, you asked, right, what I want to understand is why these things are missing, because in fact... You've just given us another potential reason. Is it because you were not asked the question, or is it because you've not realised how important these things were at the time of the interview? I can't remember, basically. Um, I can't remember, basically. If you can't remember, Mrs Misra, in an interview in 2008, how is it you remember your dealings with Michael and Junaid in 2005? Answer, it happened. It happened in my post office. Uh, your question. 
if it happened, why didn't you tell the post office this in interview? You were suggesting here, not directly, but by implication, through the use of the word if, followed up by the failure to mention something in interview, that what she was saying was false, weren't you? Well, yes. I mean, that, that would follow from the, the inconsistency uh, not being mentioned there. That, um, that I, I, I'm not sure I was aware of, of, of that piece of more recent disclosure, but it, it may, if I'm wrong about that and I've made a mistake, I, I'll let you to go to where we need to go. And if it's the case, which it appears to be the case, that those records, so that can come down now, uh, were not um, disclosed to the defence or disclosed to you, relating to the trainer Michael's experience when he was in branch. That led you to cross-examine Mrs. Miser on a false basis, didn't it? Yes, it was a bad point. I think that my understanding was that the training record had, records had been disclosed and that they couldn't remember the details. But I'm, I'm trying to remember where that was from. But, but it, it, it certainly appears clear, and it's, it's unfortunate. If there's a piece of disclosure I didn't have, caused me to take a bad point. It's an unfair point. It's not Mrs. Misdra's fault. It's the fault of the, the, the prosecution as a whole. Can I turn, please, um, to um, the call logs? And I'd like, if I may, to explore a different aspect of how the prosecution team went about giving disclosure of evidence to Mrs. Misdra and her legal representatives. And that's disclosure of the logs of calls made by Mrs. Misra to help desks about problems that she was having with the Horizon system, including in relation to balancing and discrepancies. We know that there were 135 calls that she made. Um, let's start with the raw material, a record of a call. Uh, can we start, please, with poll 3061793? And can we turn to pages 25 and following, please? And look at the bottom half of the page. And keep going, thank you. We can see that this is a record of um, a call uh, dated the 23rd of February 2006. Thank you. Um, the caller, uh, left-hand side, is Mrs. Misra, the postmaster. Yes? Yes. And if we go over the page, please. That we can see uh, new call taken by Joanne Rowland. Postmaster states she has losses every week in two stock units. MBSC states they've gone through all checks with Postmaster. MBSC states that on the CC stock unit, Postmaster has rolled over with 1,500 loss. JSA stock unit, PM, has rolled over with a £200 loss. MBSC states that on the Saturday the 18th of February, the postmaster declared her cash, and she has a £900 loss up until Saturday. And then when the postmaster declared her overnight cash on Saturday at 1 o'clock, it went back to £200 loss. MBSC also states that her AA stock unit has a £6,000 uh, loss. Postmaster has rolled over this as well. Then reading um, four or five lines on, postmaster states she has three stock units which are showing losses. Postmaster has rolled over and Postmaster states MBSC went through checks with her. And then a little bit further down. Scroll down, please. Um, about a third of the way down that page there, Kel reference number, no Kel found, so no known error log found. Yeah. Um, please check, two lines on, why the Postmaster has losses in three of her stock units. Postmaster has rolled these over before, like a checker system. MBSC states they have gone through uh, all her paperwork with her. Please see call for details. And then at the foot of the page, uh, 
an um, intervention by Anne Chambers. Can you see that at the foot of the page? Can you just scroll down, please? Update by Anne Chambers. Um, can we um, just go to the summary of this call in Mr. Dunks's witness statement, please? Poll 3058457. This is a witness statement of Mr. Dunks of the um, 29th of January, <coughs> 2010. Um, just scroll down, please. He introduces himself and says he has a working knowledge of the computer um, system known as Horizon. He's authorized by Fujitsu to undertake extractions of audit data held on the Horizon system. And then page two, please. And then the middle paragraph there, beginning I have reviewed. Um, I've reviewed the uh, Horizon um, help desk calls relate, uh, pertaining to the West Byfleet branch between June the 30th, 2005 to the 31st of December, 2009. There are 135 calls to the HSH. This equates to two to three calls, which is average for this size post office. All of the calls are of a routine nature and do not fall outside the working parameters of the system or would affect the working order of the counters. Um, he then proceeds to summarize them. Yeah. The calls, if we scroll on. Uh, next page. Can you see? And if we skip to page eight, If we can uh, scroll down, please, to number um, 29 at the foot of the page there. That's the summary of the call log that we have just read. And the summary is Anne T, NBSC, PM states she has losses every week in two stock units. Call closed by Dave Dorr. PM was getting discrepancies. SSC have investigated and advised that the NBSC take a second look at this as the office stock units appear to be in a mess. Outcome, SSC advice that call be passed back to NBSC for further investigation. At trial, was this the extent of the information disclosed in the hearing as to the nature and extent of the calls that Mrs. Misra had made. Do you mean the statement and the and the log that we looked at as well? Yes. Was the log disclosed too? I think so. I, I mean, I, I can't actually remember. I, I, I thought it had been, but... You'd agree that this summary of it doesn't really do justice to what we read? No, it doesn't, it doesn't do the, the amounts and so forth. It's not quite as much detail, I agree. Well, it's an inadequate summary of it, isn't it? Yes. But my, my, my recollection was the call logs were disclosed. But well, and where, where, what are you basing that recollection on? If, what, it's just what I, I, I remember. I mean, if, I, if I'm wrong about that, then I'm wrong. But I, I would expect them to be disclosed, not simply a statement. Not simply a statement no. summarising? No. And if... But... I mean, it obviously can be checked easily enough. I don't want to waste time if I've, if I've mis misremembered something. Looking at it now, if I was prosecuting a case now, I'd expect the call logs to be disclosed together with the witness statement. We've That's what I'm assuming happened, but I can't actually remember it now. I thought that had happened, but I can't actively remember it. Can you recall whether at trial the um, contents of the call logs themselves, the underlying data, was brought into evidence? I can't 
specifically recall it. I, I, that's what I thought had happened, but um, actually a memory of it and seeing a document of it, I can't remember at the moment. But I'm sure it can be checked. It's, it's either there or it isn't, I would have thought. Well, we do have a document from Mr Dunks exhibiting something, and we don't yes. know what the what, what oh, the something see. consists of. Well, I... Because he was, he was cross-examined at some detail, and I can't see how he can be cross-examined without the logs. That's what made me think that he, we had the logs. I, I would order that it, it is obvious that one should disclose the logs. If a statement summarises, one should disclose the logs that are being summarised. That, that's obvious. And that should happen. I thought it had happened. If it hadn't, then that, that was wrong. It should have happened. Thank you. Um, lastly, on the Misra case, your opening and closing um, speeches to the jury... Can we look, please, at UKGI 0001-4994? Oh, we can see this is a transcript for the 11th of October 2010. And if we scroll down, we can see you're listed as Prosecution Counsel. And if we go to page 30, please. And scroll down, please. We can see there where your um, opening speech um, commences. Yes. And can we go to page 49, please? Uh, at B, you describe what the um, Horizon system is. You say the system, the Crown say, is actually a fairly simple system to use. It's got nice coloured buttons, big buttons, and it's got clear instructions in English. But it's also been a system that's been used for a very long time and has, in fact, recently been replaced by an upgraded Horizon system, but it was rolled out to post offices between 1999 and 2002 and has continued until um, uh, 2010. So at the time we are concerned with, there would have been a lot of post offices shut down, of course, recently. But in the time we're concerned with, there would have been around 14,000 post office branches. And you can just imagine how many transactions the Horizon system has to go through when you think of that number of branches. The computer system will literally process millions of transactions every single day and in peak times, like around Christmas, perhaps nearly 20 million transactions per day. So it's got to be a pretty robust system. And you'll hear some evidence from an expert in the field as to the quality of the system. Nobody's saying it's perfect, and you will no doubt hear about a particular problem that was found. But the Crown say it is a robust system. And if there were really a computer problem, the defendant would have been aware of it. That's the whole point, because when you use a computer system, you realise there's something wrong. If not from the screen itself, but from the printouts you're getting when you're doing the stock take. So that is one issue in the case, whether the Horizon system is any good or not. The post office, sorry, the Crown say it must be good, otherwise the whole post office would collapse. But you are nevertheless going to have to consider that very carefully and consider all the evidence you're going to hear. Would you agree that what you're saying there is a version of a prosecutor's fallacy, namely the chances of Horizon getting fictitious shortfalls must be small because it works reliably in 14,000 offices millions of time a day millions of times a day and therefore you can conclude mrs misra is guilty i don't think so no I, i'm saying that generally it works but i also say in, in my i think in both opening and closing speeches all computers can have glitches and these things happen but to, to, all i think i'm saying by that is not that it's a it's a it's a probability exercise I'm saying it's generally ro a robust system. It's not perfect, and I made, made it clear that it was not, um, 
it was not perfect. It wasn't infallible. When, when the defence suggested the Crown was saying that, I made clear that that wasn't what we were saying. I, I don't think... I certainly didn't mean it as some sort of exercise in probability. Why were you mentioning all of the other post offices in, so that, well, in, in which it worked and all of the other transactions? Well, because to, to show that it was generally a robust system, which is what I understood it to be. Uh, if... Um, if, if a system does work in a lot of offices, there, 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 there must be a lot of good to the system. It's not excluding the possibility there might be glitches. Um, gl glitches happen on computers. It, it, every day in a courtroom, if something happens with a computer, it doesn't mean the computer itself is bad. Uh, it means that glitches are relatively the, the, a, a part of part and parcel, but a system that, in general terms, is, is relatively good. From whom did you receive instructions that the integrity of the system was such that it could be described as robust? Well, the robust term was used regularly by the, by the post office, and I sought to justify it by argument, not to rise simply on it being a mantra. I was affected also by um, the evidence, as I understood it, from... Uh, from uh, Mr. Jenkins and also from the, the, the proposition which I thought at the time was significant that I understood from my instructing solicitor that Crown offices where there wasn't a shop attached didn't seem to have the same sort of problems. But I appreciate that I, I, may, have, um, I may have missed things, I may have been misinformed, but that's the information as I understood it to be. You say in your witness statement, I did not seek to hide behind the mantra that Horizon was robust. No, I don't seek to hide behind a mantra. I sought to justify the term. That's what I mean. And you're justifying the term in um, terms of probabilities here, aren't you? No. Well, well no, it, it, there's a difference between saying a system generally works and it's very unlikely it's failed in this case. I'm not making the second point. I'm making the point that it works generally, which means generally it's probably pretty good. But nothing's perfect, um, and glitches happen. I was very clear about that, with, with, in, in both opening and closing. Very clear to tell the jury that if they thought the loss could, might largely be explained as a result of computer error, they'd be very likely to acquit. Thank you. That can come down. Um, in relation to Mr Jenkins' oral evidence at trial... I think it's right that when you called him, you didn't seek to establish that he understood his expert duties. Not in the witness box, no. But I, I, thought, that he, I thought it was obvious from everything I saw of him. And I give an example in my witness statement of how careful he was. Thank you very much. That's all I ask on Mr. Um, Mrs. Misra's case. Can I turn to two other cases much more shortly? Certainly. Firstly, Carl Page. Um, uh, firstly, a general question. Can you help us as to whether or not Mr Jenkins had any role in the prosecution of Carl Page, he whether pro by provision of a witness statement or giving evidence at trial? He had no role. My understanding is that his first um, involvement as a witness... This is my understanding, but it was from what my conversations with him, I think his first involvement as a witness in a trial was the Misra case. I understand that... Um, Debbie Staple, what I knew her as Debbie Helsham, um, that she suggested Gareth Jenkins gave evidence at, um, at the Dudley trial. That is completely incorrect, and it's, it's simply misremembering. I was at the trial for six weeks. I called a number of witnesses. I took notes of all the evidence. I wish I had the notes still. They're long gone on an old computer. But I heard all the evidence. Gareth Jenkins was not a witness in that case. Uh, and also, I've... Um, there's an email that I don't need to take you to it, but you'll remember the email when Gareth Jenkins says it was nice to put names to faces after the conference. If I'd met him before at Merry Hill or Dudley, um, then he wouldn't have said that. So it, it seems clear to me that from my memory, but also the logic of the evidence, Gareth Jenkins wasn't involved in the Page case at all. And I think um, it's right that you've seen, like us, no witness statement from him. Yes, and that's the reason. And, and, and I, I checked because I looked at... Um, Debbie Staples' evidence yesterday, and I checked it against the witness statements I have, and they, they, there's an absence of any reference to computers working. Um, the, the inquirer will be aware that 
often the post office tried to rely on section 69 of PACE long after it had been uh, fallen away. But I, I, my recollection is that nobody sought to suggest the computer systems, anything about the computer systems in the Page case. It was really dealt with on the basis of the, of the, the, the branch trading accounts. Uh, he's not mentioned in yours and Mr. John's opening note, is he? No, he's not. He's not mentioned by the experts. I think he's not mentioned significantly in a list of witnesses. So I find it very hard to see how he possibly could have become involved. And Debbie Helsham, uh, Debbie, Debbie, Debbie Staple, I should say now, she was president for the first week of the trial because it's far away. When, from London, you have to stay up there. It's quite awkward to get to the Merry Hill site. Um, and she, I think, would have seen some witnesses because I think she was there for the first week. But she wasn't for the remainder. Um, so when she said, I remember seeing Gareth e uh, Jenkins give evidence, it seem, seems to me that she may be confused on that point. Um, Thank you. In view of the time, I'm not going to ask you about the other case, the Susan Rudkin case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Those are the only question, questions I asked, Mr. Tatford. Um, I think there are some questions from core participants. No from How and Co. No. No. Thank you. Um, from Hodgels, but yes, from HJA. So, Mr. Henry. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tatford, I, I represent several sub -pace masters one of whom, of course, is Mrs. Seema Misra, who sits beside me. Thank yes. you for your apology. And without any desire to harrow your feelings, I would like to remind you of what happened to Mrs. Misra as a result of her being prosecuted to conviction. As you recall, on the 11th of November 2010, she was sentenced to 15 months imprisonment for the offence of theft and six months imprisonment on each of the false accounting charges to run concurrently. She went to prison on her son Ardi's 10th birthday at a time when she was 10 weeks pregnant with her second son, Jay. And immediately upon being sentenced, she collapsed in shock, complaining of severe abdominal pain, and was taken straight to hospital for overnight observation before being removed to HMP Bronzefield the following evening. You may not be aware of this, but she was pilloried in the local press before and after her imprisonment as a pregnant thief who got off lightly. She was released on tag after nearly four months inside. It was a hellish time. Her husband, Devinder, was racially abused and beaten up in the street. He suffered the vilest racist abuse in the months that followed his wife's trial and imprisonment. And Mrs. Misra, on her release from prison, was a pariah. No one would talk to her, offer friendship, support, or consolation. And because she was ostracized, a childminding business she'd started failed as no one wanted to employ her. As for her second Forgive me, as for her eldest son, Ardi, she deliberately took him late to school so that she wouldn't be shunned by the other parents at the school gate. And she tried to conceal the shame of her imprisonment from him, saying she'd been in hospital when she had not. Ardi, who knows, may have become complicit in this pretense to protect his mother, but was not officially told the truth whatever he may have gathered in the playground or elsewhere, that his mother had been jailed whilst carrying his brother Jay until the results of the Bates litigation some nine years later. Turning to the family's financial position, perhaps you were aware, I'm sure you were, that uh, a considerable amount of family wealth had been used to make up for shortfalls before she was prosecuted. Yes, no, that, that came out in the evidence. You were aware of that. And then, of course, compounded by her subsequent conviction and disgrace, that family wealth was obliterated. Um, her family lost almost everything. And despite the Bates litigation, Mrs. Misra was, as a convicted person, excluded from being a claimant and was only given a meagre ex gratia payment by those who settled the case. Perhaps you weren't aware of that. I wasn't aware of that, no. no. Uh, and even now, her family's financial state remains insecure 
and they live a precarious existence. So, so thank you for your apology, but having listened to what I've just praised from the human impact hearing, which was heard on the 25th of February 2022, is there anything further you would wish to say to her about how you as independent counsel were misled and how you, despite, as you say, trying your best, came to preside as independent prosecution counsel over what you have accepted yourself was a disaster? Yes. Um, well, um, I, I've, I've thought about Mrs. Misra's case for a very long time. And um, I, I found it difficult at the time. Um, I found it a stressful case to prosecute. And I, I've thought about it for many, many occasions afterwards. And I've followed the, the publicity. Um, and it's taken me a very long time, in fact, to, to, to come to the view that I, I expressed at the beginning of my evidence. Um, I've actually found, um, I've, I've actually found the exercise, and it, it's been quite a demanding exercise to, to, to do a witness statement, to go through matters. I, I've found that's clarified my mind as to, as to what happened, and when I said I felt ashamed, I do. And um, I actually feel worse because it's become quite clear in the way in the, the evidence has properly been put before me that there are many failings that I had, I had ignored on my part. And I perhaps created a, a rosier vision with, with, in my memory that wasn't really there. Um, I, I apologize unreservedly uh, for what happened. I hope it can be remedied in some way. I hope that. I don't know what happens with compensation in the future. That's obviously something out, outside of, of my control. But um, the, this inquiry process has um, been highly informative and um, it's, it's some good I hope will come from it. Um, I've changed my view. It's taken me a long time. I suspect I was in denial for a long time perhaps in a self-justificatory way, and, um, and I apologize for that. Um, well, well Mr. Tatford, thank you very much. I do not doubt your feelings as expressed. Do you now consider, particularly in the light of counsel to the inquiries, questions to you, and the way in which matters even today have been revealed to you, do you now consider that you were misled by the post office as to the reliability and robustness of the horizon system before and during Mrs. Misra's trial? I, I think I was misled. I find it difficult to understand where the, where the, where the original source is. Uh, and that's something the inquiry will, will, will no doubt show. But the... To give an example, I hope this helps, because I, I, um, I haven't been asked about um, the... Um, Mandy Talbot, for instance, was asked about some documents that, that she... Uh, that, uh, in her evidence, about a, a, a draft report in relation to um, the Castleton case, and also um, some... Uh, a, a report from Mr. Coney and um, an, a, a, an advice from counsel in a case from Blackpool Wilson Home, I think is the name of the case. Um, I wasn't shown that material. Now, I, haven't, I, I did go to some trouble to try and discover material, and I remain very surprised that those two items were not given to me, particularly as I, I attended the civil office on two separate days with, the, with a period of time in between. But I, I, I'm, I, I am a, I'm conscious of a way of thinking um, which is betrayed in that robust, the, the robust mantra that is used. And so it's, it's difficult for me to... I, I remain in a certain sense of confusion. I'm not trying to be difficult. It seems to me that if it is right, and I don't know the full facts in terms of the disclosure from the, from the appeal, 
uh, and other matters about Horizon. It appears that there clearly were matters that should have been brought to my attention from the very beginning, should have been brought to my attention, potentially the criminal law department. Quite where the failure to provide evidence, information has come from it is unclear to me. But I was not given a full position of, of the problems with Horizon. That's absolutely clear, which involves being misled in some way by whom it's, it's difficult for me to say. Um, and I, 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 I have to be careful about this because I simply don't know. But what is clear, and I discover more about it, and I'll be learning more as the inquiry progresses, but there, there are problems that should have been relatively straightforward to put before those who prosecute the cases and who decide whether to charge people. And that didn't happen. And quite why that happened is I remain unclear about that. So you mentioned there that you visited the civil offices and important documents concerning, for example, the Cleveleys case um, were not shown to you? No. The, and I should be careful. The, certainly the Cleveleys documents. The, I looked at Castleton files. It's so long ago, I can't remember now what exactly I saw. But I, I would be very surprised if I had missed a draft report that suggested a horizon error, because that's precisely what I was looking for. And I didn't see all the boxes. So if I were to put names to you, you would not wish to because of the uncertainty that still exists in your own mind. You would not wish to, for example, uh, point the finger at any individual. Is that...? Well, I think... Th th no, that is right. I, I, I don't know. Um, the... From I what you have seen today, however, particularly given counsel to the inquiry's questions, um, a certain sort of mindset. Do, do you now accept that there appeared to be within the legal department and those connected to the legal department at the post office a certain siege mentality that Horizon was under attack? It was being assailed by, for example, Mrs. Misra uh, and others, and that if the walls were breached, then chaos, confusion, and widespread theft by sub-postmasters would follow? Well, there was certainly uh, a fear about, um, well, as, as was shown in the email that was shown to, uh, to me from my instructing solicitor, which I, wasn't, I didn't think I was aware of, um, suggesting to Mr. Jenkins what he should do. I have to confess, I seem to have been guilty of similar, uh, similar suggestions. But there was a very clear mindset there. I think the word risible was, was suggested in terms of how to instruct an expert. And that is indicative of a mindset. I'd have to accept that. Yes. And um, the... I, I wouldn't... The feeling of that the, the horizon system worked, I think it seemed to me that was a feeling genuinely widely held. But it may follow from that that there's a fear uh, that an attack to a system they thought well of needs to be needs to be confronted. And so that in a way that's a siege mentality. In a way that is is a way to to to, to describe it, I suppose. Um, so there could be the benign siege mentality based on overconfidence in the system, or there could have been, and I don't suggest that you would have been a part of this, a malign siege mentality, being aware of the deficiencies and defects, but deliberately seeking to suppress them. There, certainly in terms of, um, as I, the, the, the email I, talk, I talked about, John L. Singh to, to, to Gareth Jenkins, that, that, that's a good example of a potential benign siege mentality. I'd agree with that. Quite 
to what extent there was a deliberate attempt by any person to withhold information. That that's remains to me a little unclear to me. I, don't, I simply don't know enough about what has been disclosed in the, in the appeal process. For, for instance, I've never seen that. I've, I've seen that. I, I simply have seen the judgment in Hamilton and others. Uh, I haven't seen any disclosure. I was asked. To, uh, I was asked a question about a piece of disclosure, for instance, which I haven't seen since, which I refer to in my, in my witness statement. I'm not sure I quite have enough information. I'm so sorry, I'm not trying to be, un, I'm not trying yeah, to be unhelpful. I accept but that. But I, 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 I am very conscious that one... I, I can only really deal with what I have, ever, I have knowledge of. Well, can I move on now to Fujitsu? Do you now consider you were misled by Fujitsu? as to the reliability and robustness of Horizon at the time of Mrs. Misra's trial? Again, I don't know the full extent of faults, although I remember, I, I, as I said earlier, I watched um, Debbie Staples' evidence yesterday and what she said about that dynamite document. Um, I, I, I remain very troubled about what I said in my advice, that Fujitsu need to be asked. And I appreciate that it may be more complicated than that, the watering down effect I acknowledge. But I, I did ask the question, and um, it doesn't ever seem to have been answered. But concerning, and I suppose arising from what you've just said, the vital issue of disclosure, you unequivocally accept that because of a flawed approach to disclosure, Mrs. Misra did not receive a fair trial? Oh, yes. And that's that, but that it's, it's more important. That's what the Court of Appeal have to decide, and what was conceded significantly by the, the, the most experienced criminal t team for the respondents that one can imagine. And as was elicited and elucidated by counsel to the inquiry, the manner in which she was cross-examined and the premise upon which the case was open and closed was regrettably specious and spurious, was it not? I feel, well, the, the time I felt it was fair and it was based on the evidence. Now I feel uncomfortable reading uh, what I say about a, a robust system and so forth. More than uncomfortable, surely? Oh, yes. Well, um, I, I don't have the full information, but I, feel, I do feel very uncomfortable reading that, yes. Now, you have, in answer to questions posed by counsel of the inquiry and just recently, uh, in your, one of your recent responses to me, you acknowledge the possibility, don't you, that you got caught up in the battle over Horizon's reliability, for example, in the way in which you were interacting with Mr. Jenkins? Well, I certainly... Um, that may be right. I got caught up in what was a very stressful disclosure exercise and a way that's being caught up in the battle. It wasn't on my part, I hope, any, any idea to want to preserve Horizon because, of course, I'm, I'm a self-employed barrister. I'm not, it's, um, but um, I was certainly caught up in the pressures of, of the situation. And uh, looking at it now, I, I, I did some things that nowadays I, I wouldn't do. I'm more experienced now than I was then, but I was, I was pretty experienced at the time. I mean, essentially you became embroiled in the battle, and I'm not suggesting that you had any stake in the battle because you were independent counsel, but you became embroiled in it, didn't you? I think it did affect me, yes. And... Uh, I mean, I suggest to you that at times you fail to exercise detachment and objectivity concerning your own witness, who was to become an expert witness at that. Do you, do you accept that? No, I think that is right, yes. So I, I don't take you to the statement um, of the 6th of October 2010 that you uh, commented upon but you will accept, don't you, that many of the changes that you were suggesting were not out of clarification or elucidation, but they were designed to insulate the prosecution case from attack, weren't they? Well, 
they were um, they were designed to meet points raised by the defence expert, which which would be to insulate. Which, well, in a way, yes, that would be right. I thought I saw it at the time as clarifying issues. That may I, I can look at that now and think that's uh, perhaps wishful thinking on my part. Well, I now want to um, come to the issue of robustness. And if your witness statement, uh, Mr. Tatford, uh, WITN 961 uh, could be put up on screen, uh, I, wa I want to concentrate on part of paragraph 98, which is to be pa found at page 53 of your witness statement, Mr. Tatford. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you can see uh, in um, that paragraph, I hope my speeches were fair. They are all set out in the transcript so others can judge. I did not seek to hide behind the mantra that Horizon was robust. I argued that point on the evidence. I did not suggest that the system was infallible. And I conceded that all computer systems can have glitches, which is a matter of common sense and human experience. May I ask you this, Mr. Tatford? Do you not think that the prosecutorial decision not to obtain the services of an independent forensic IT expert for the prosecution ought to have caused you to be highly cautious and circumspect in respect of all of your submissions, whether to the court or the jury, on the central issue of Horizon's reliability. Well, the... Um certainly had, had an impact that um, the, the way we, we dealt with expert and evidence in the case and um, I mean if it is the case that there are manifold uh, weaknesses and problems with horizon that I wasn't aware of then my words are very hollow indeed could I take you to a transcript from your closing speech and um, this is P.O.L. 0065708 at pages 23 to 24. Thank you. At pages 23 to 24. And just scrolling down, please. Just scrolling down. Yes, um, at letter G there, Mr. Tatford, I conceded in my opening speech to you that no computer system is infallible. There are computer glitches with any system. Of course there are. But Horizon is clearly a robust system used at the time we are concerned with, with 14,000 post offices. Mr. Bayfield talked about 14 million transactions a day. It has got to work, has it not? Otherwise, the post office would fall apart. So there may be glitches. There may be serious glitches. That is perfectly possible as a theoretical possibility. But as a whole, the system works uh, and has been shown to work in practice. Now, now, Mr. Tatford, very briefly, because this has already been addressed by Learning Council to the inquiry, if it hasn't happened on 14 million occasions, then it cannot have happened on the 14 millionth and first. That is a version of the prosecutor's fallacy, isn't it? Well, I wasn't see, trying to seek to make that argument. Um, Do you think, though, that it could have been easily misconstrued? The chances, for example, of Horizon generating fictitious shortfalls are very small because, as you've told the jury, it works reliably in 14,000 offices 
with 14 million daily transactions. And from there, it is not difficult for a jury to understand your submission. Well, therefore, Mrs. Misra must be guilty. No, there is, there is a danger of that. And I'm actually looking at my words as well. I'm, I'm very uncomfortable, actually. It's the words theoretical possibility. I think that's a word that I shouldn't have used. Um, the, what I tried to do in, in my speech was actually to say that glitches are possible. And um, if, but, um, but then you would have offered no evidence. Well, the, the well, if I'd known that, which, if, which may be the case, it's a matter, I think, for the inquiry to determine, and they're matters that I don't know. But the, the, I relied to a great extent on decisions that Mrs. Misra made, things that were said later, and changes of defense, and so forth. I accept all of that doesn't amount to a hill of beans if the prosecution case is based on foundations of sand. And if the re reality is, as um, Debbie Staples said yesterday, I, I've said that she may be mistaken about something she remembers. I actually think of her uh, very highly and was a very able lawyer. And, very, and she was the person, for instance, that explained the case of Carl Page to me. Um, but her reaction I found very powerful yesterday, and it's part of my continuing... Uh, reflection on this. Uh, when she said that document was dynamite, I, um, well, I rather agreed with that, and it caused me considerable concern. I, I, I didn't. I, I still don't have the full context of that. I hope to find out as, as we as the inquiry goes along. I'm not suggesting you would be up to speed on this, but it, it's the Horizon IT issues judgment, and in contradistinction to your submission, which was a submission which was made to the learned judge in that case, uh, Mr. Justice Fraser as was. He deprecated that approach and, and he, he stated that the proper approach, or to use his exact words, the correct analytical approach is to consider the branch activity for that branch for that period, consider the evidence both for and against, one, the existence of a bug and two, the likely cause of the discrepancy, bearing in mind both the burden and standard of proof, make findings on the cause of the discrepancy, and then apply those findings. So, so based on that, Mr. Tatford, and, and bearing in mind, of course, the burden of standard of proof in a criminal trial, the correct question for the jury was whether they could be sure that Horizon generated the shortfall at West Byfleet um, as a genuine loss of cash from the tills over the indictment period, or whether it was an artifact. So it has to be analyzed that the jury have to be sure on your case that the horizon generated shortfall reflected a genuine loss of cash from the tills. You accept that? Yes. Uh, and if based on all the evidence about the existence of bugs, errors and defects, the shortfalls were likely or may have been the result of bugs, errors and defects, then the right verdict would have been not guilty, yes. would it not? Um, could I now move on to my final subject, which is flaws obvious to the user? And during your opening and closing statements, as well as during cross-examination of witnesses, you asserted repeatedly that errors would be obvious to the user. Uh, that isn't controversial, is it? You remember saying that. Well, what I meant by that, I hope, I hope I tried to make clear, is that the, the user is able to, by the horizon printouts, to see where problems rise. I wasn't seeking to show that one can simply see the, see the errors emerge in front of one just by looking at the screen. I didn't seek to make that point. If that's how it's understood, then that would be wrong. And if I haven't made that clear enough, then, then, then I was wrong. Could it have been that the theme that such flaws would have been obvious to the user was a strategy to convince the judge on the application and the jury for the verdict that Ms. Misra, Mrs. Misra should have been keenly aware of any horizon problems that she should have been able to discern and diagnose bugs, errors, and defects? 
I wasn't trying to make that point. If, if it came across that way, then I haven't made it clear enough. All I was trying to make the point was that by, by the, the various printouts, it's possible to determine where a loss is arising. That's the point I was trying to make. From, from, from your repeated question, it seems to me I did, obviously didn't make that clearly enough. And clarity is important in prosecuting. Well, I, I'm grateful for your concession. Do, do you also think that framing the issue in that way was to reverse the burden of proof? Because, of course, in law it was the post office's duty prosecuting the case in the name of the Crown to prove that the system was working to satisfy the jury that they were sure that the system was working. It was not for Mrs. Misra to identify when it may not have been. But I wasn't trying to take it quite as far as that. I was suggesting that Mrs. Mrs. Misra might be in a position to say where problems might be arising. Right. Um, I, can, I can see the danger in that, though. I, I can see by pushing it just a bit too far the danger you, you, you've, you've, you've alerted to me to can arise, and if I, if I took it too far, then, then that's a mistake. I tried not to do that, but I, I can see the, the, the danger potentially there. Do you recall, and no need to put it up on screen if you do recall it, but it's um, poll 30054346. This was your response to Mr. Hadrill's abuse of process. Yes. Um, if, as the defence alleged, there was a continuing problem, this is your paragraph two, with the Horizon system at West Byfleet, Mrs. Misra should have been keenly aware of it at the time it was occurring. Well, by, by that I meant by, by losses occurring. I see. Uh, and all, all I was seeking to make the point in, in that argument was to simply s to suggest it might be a, a basis for, for, a more, for what I saw as more focused disclosure requests. I see. I now want to go, in conclusion, to an example, uh, or an extract, I should say, from your closing speech, which is POL 00065708. And while that is being put up on the screen, it, it, it occurs to me that, of course, in view of your last answer, that it would have been vitally important that the summary of calls to the help desk were very, very accurately preceded if they were going to be preceded at all. Because otherwise, uh, again, the trial would proceed on a false premise. You accept that? Yes. So could we please go to the top of page 26? And the top of page 26. Um, but the point the Crown make is, if something is going wrong, the operator knows it. That is the point. And Mrs. Misra has given you no evidence whatsoever of being aware of a computer problem. Um, that would tend to have been contradicted by the full logs to the help desk, wouldn't it? Yes, could, could I just, would you mind, could we just scroll up to the bottom of the previous page? Just of so course, by all means. So, bottom of page 25. Yes, and if, we, if we could scroll down to the next page, please, I'm sorry. Yes, I've got, I've got the context. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? It's my fault, I'm of, sorry. Of course. Um, the, the, the theme was the same. If something is going wrong, the operator knows it. That is the point. And Mrs. Misra has given you no evidence whatsoever of being aware of a computer problem. That would tend to be contradicted, wouldn't it, by the um, more full account of uh, the calls to the help desk? Yes, I think those calls, though... Um the losses they relate to may, I think, refer to the, to the time of the, the thefts of, from employees rather than the later computer problem. It's quite early in the time period. I see. But returning to it in general, and this is my final point again... That, you, that's the third final point, Mr Henry, so I'm going to hold you to a minute now. I, I, I'm very sorry, um, sir. I do apologise. This is my final point, and it's one sentence. Based upon what you 
have submitted to the jury there, Mr. Tatford, and I'm grateful for your assistance thus far. If something is going wrong, the operator knows it. That is the point. And Mrs. Misra has given you no evidence whatsoever of being aware of a computer problem. You, of course, are now aware that there were a number of bugs, errors, and defects that were not uh, disseminated to the network of sub-postmasters and were withheld. The knowledge of them was withheld. You're aware, you're aware of that? Yes. But do you again, on reflection, feel that you framed the issue in a way that it inevitably reversed the burden of proof? Well, I think that the wording I use in that passage is, 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 is too strong. I agree with that. Mr. Tatford, those are the questions I ask, and thank you. Is that it, Mr. Pierre? Uh, yes, it is, sir. Well, um, I know that Mrs. Misra is present, and the day has been about her case virtually exclusively, but certainly very largely. So I hope, Mrs. Misra, that you found today informative. Um, so far as you, Mr. Tatford, are concerned, I'm very grateful to you for a detailed witness statement and for answering a great many questions today. Um, and so we'll now close today's session and resume again at 10 o'clock tomorrow. That's right, sir. Thank you. Thank you.